Well, good morning. Welcome to Living Stones Church. Uh, welcome you folks online wherever you are and welcome you folks outside. Happy Valentine's Day. Um, as Kimberly already mentioned, what we're going to be doing today is continuing on in our series on 1 Corinthians. And you might say, well, is it a Valentine's Day message? And the answer is, yeah, kind of it is, really, uh, because we're going to be looking at love. And Valentine's Day is all about love, but we're going to be looking at love from an angle that maybe you don't really associate with Valentine's Day so much. But it is a love that's important for us to be able to, to grab hold of and understand. It's, it's about a love that, um, that goes beyond romantic love and a love that seeks the best, truly. It, it's about a kind of love that loves so much the other person that it involves a willingness for you to appear like you're unloving. You know, so many times love is something that we, we love and we want people to recognize that we love them. And that, that's good, that's good. But there's oftentimes a love that has to endure the miscomprehension, the misapprehension that the love that you express isn't received as love. We're going to jump into that a bit today. Let's pray first, though. Father, I, I ask you to just adjust our minds right now. Adjust our minds by your word. Adjust our minds to your word. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you'd come in and bless us with that capacity to receive from you today, to change the way we look at things, to be able to receive what you have, to move more fully into the purposes that you have for us in extending your kingdom right here in Kona. All of this, Father, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, and by the way, kids, if you're outside and didn't head to children's ministry yet, head on over there now. Children's ministry is for uh, kids up through the fifth grade. Okay, like I said, we're in 1 Corinthians. We're actually today up to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Give you a quick recap, though. What we've looked at, the first four chapters, the first three weeks, is the Apostle Paul coming in and addressing a church that's really messed up. And he's coming in and basically repeating himself for the past three weeks by saying, look, you guys, quit drawing lines, quit dividing, quit arguing, learn to get along and, and maintain unity. I mean, he's just harping on that over and over and over again. Today, today, um, you might get whiplash because it seems like he heads in exactly the opposite direction. Because as we pick up 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, hey, draw some lines here. Don't accept everybody. Kick some people out of the church. I mean, what in the world is going on here when he's talking about unity, get along, don't let your differences be divisive, and then he's saying, yeah, there's some things that you do need to divide over. And that's exactly what 1 Corinthians 5 talks about. He says there's a place that we're to draw the line. There's a place where it's love to draw the line. It's something that, again, goes beyond the way we look at things sometimes. It's like the idea that loving and judging go together. And in 1 Corinthians 5, he addresses how that happens. And you may, get, you may go, well, how, how in the world can you do that? How can you love and judge? And by the way, by the way, doesn't the Bible, didn't Jesus say, judge not? So what's going on with this stuff? Well, just a little clarification on that. Matthew chapter 7, Luke chapter 6, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Jesus did say, judge not. But whenever we read those passages, uh, we come away so often thinking that he said, judge not, period. He didn't. He said, judge not, comma. And then he gave the whole big picture context on how it's actually supposed to, to work. So what we're going to do today is look at and consider what Jesus did say, what Jesus himself said in terms of this whole matter of judging and loving. But this is where it gets interesting. We're not just seeing the abstract teaching on judge not or judge and love, but we're seeing a case study on it. We're seeing the application of it because what Paul has done, he's taken what Jesus has said in Matthew 7, and now he's applying it to the nitty-gritty day-in, day-out stuff that happens with people. He's applying it in, in this church in, in Corinth. So we're looking then at first chap, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, and, and I, I'll tell you, this, this chapter 5, I, I'd, I'd suggest to you is perhaps the most disobeyed passage of Scripture in the entire Bible. It's, it's a weird deal. It's a weird deal. In fact, you, you don't often find too many people wanting to spend too much time looking at this. Uh, but I'm thinking I'm going to package this as a Valentine's Day message for every year and see, see, how, that, see how that goes over. We'll, we'll determine that after today. But uh, the case study begins 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 
in the first eight verses. That's where the case study goes on. What we see in 1 Corinthians 5 is, is this idea that there are two different groups that are involved whenever judgment comes into play. And let me say this real quickly. If you're on YouTube or, or church online right now and you're thinking, I need to switch over to a, a Valentine's Day message from somebody else, or if you're outside and about to sneak out the South Gate, let me real quickly say, what we're talking about when we're talking about judging, what Paul's talking about here involves completely different categories of people. It talks about where judging is to happen, and it does absolutely talk about where judging is not supposed to happen. So it's not just jump in with both feet and start criticizing people. It goes a lot deeper than that. It goes a lot further than that. What we're looking at here is the idea that we are people who need to know how to judge rightly in order to know how to love properly. And the weird deal is that there are two categories of people, ones that we judge and ones that we don't. And most of the time, we get it exactly backwards exactly backwards. We judge the people that the Bible commands us not to judge, and we fail to judge the people that the Bible commands us that we are to judge. And then we wonder why things are, 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 such, a, are such a mess, are such a mess. Okay, let's, let's jump into 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and see what happens here, what the Apostle Paul writes here. Again, inspired by God, the Holy Spirit. Verses 1 and 2. Paul's writing to the church in Corinth again. This church has been messed up. He's been saying unity, unity, unity. But now he says, it's actually reported to me that there is immorality among you and immorality of such a nasty kind that you don't even see it among the Gentiles. Someone is dating his dad's wife. I mean, this is weird, right? Someone is going to bed with his father's wife. That's all they tell us in the Greek and in the English. We don't know exactly what's going on here, but assuming the best, we're talking about a guy who is sleeping with his stepmother. We don't know whether the father's alive or not. We don't know where it's happening or how it's happening, but we do know that everybody in the church knows about it. See, in Corinth, at this point, historians say that the church there was probably around 50 people, could be as many as 100 people, but it's small. One church, they all know each other. They're all in each other's business and everybody knows what's going on with this guy and, and again, most likely his, his stepmother. And, and Paul's going, look, even, the, even the, the Corinthians who are famous for their immorality are saying, yuck, that is not right. That is not right. And, and Paul is saying, but, but you guys, he says, have become arrogant. You've become proud about this. It's like he's saying, you think it's cute. You think it's, it's cool. You think it's, it, it, it's hip and current and that you're so broad-minded that, that you're allowing this to go on right under your noses. He goes on from there and then in verses three to five, he says, look, <laughs> I, on my part, though absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that, important two words, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Paul is saying to the church, look, get this guy out. Get this guy out. And, and the church probably would respond maybe like we would, but Paul isn't that judgmental. And his response back again, yes, it's judgmental. Now kick him out. Now kick him out. I mean, you go, well, this is, this is not right, Paul. I mean, we're told to judge not. And Paul's going, look, I'm one of the original Christians and I'm saying judge. Now, again, context what we're talking about here. Need to qualify this real quickly. We're not talking about a situation where somebody, you know, fell off the wagon one weekend. We're not talking about a situation where somebody fell into any flavor of sin, but then regretted what they've done. We're not talking about somebody who wanted to change, even in a repeated pattern of sin. We're talking about somebody who had embraced a lifestyle. We're talking about somebody who had embraced this pattern of sin and didn't want to let go of it, wasn't willing to say they should let go of it, were holding on to it, and a church that was was affirming them in, in the process of it. This is what Paul's addressing 
here. And this is what he said that we need to pay uh, uh, attention, attention to. Uh, again, he says, so you guys are proud. You think it's cute, you think it's cool. He says, no, it should have broken your hearts. It should have broken your hearts. Now, some people, right now, you're of the, the type that's saying, I'm glad we're talking about judgment because there are so many people I'm ready to cut loose on. So many people that have irritated me, so many people that I'm so tired of in terms of what they're doing. You know, if that's the case, you're not yet qualified to confront anybody. The idea here is there's gotta be a brokenness of heart that comes in. There's gotta be a love motivation that comes in. There's gotta be a situation where the idea of confronting is one that comes from a desire for the restoration of the person that you're addressing. This whole deal here with Paul is not about punishment. The judgment that, that comes in, the judging that comes in between believers is never about punishing. It's about restoring. It's about restoring, and that's what he says he wants to do. He says, I mean, in, in verse five, that, those two words I said to pay attention to, so that, I've decided to deliver such a one to Satan, so that, so that he can be restored. What's delivering somebody to Satan? That sounds pretty harsh, right? Well, he's just saying, look, the, the body of Christ, the church, the local church, is a place where there's protection, it's a place where there's covering, it's a place where, where the Holy Spirit moves more readily in terms of the changes that he wants to bring about in people. And when he's saying, kick them out, turn them over to Satan, he's saying, put them out of that protection, put them out of that covering, put them into that arena where they can just run wild with what they're doing. Now, right off the bat, right off the bat, I've got to tell you that reading through this, as I'm trying to actually think how this applies, I don't feel good about this. I don't feel like it's the right way to do it. I don't feel like it's, it's something that's gonna work. I mean, it seems to me like the better way to do it is to keep somebody like that close. I mean, yeah, they've embraced it. Yeah, they're all in with it. Yeah, they aren't admitting it's wrong. But it seems to me like the best way to address it is to keep on trying, to keep on pushing, to keep on addressing them with the kind of love that I wanna address them with. And that's where we get into trouble. When we go with what we feel like we ought to do when it runs contrary to what God says is going to work. See, this is also a flavor of pride. I mean, it's always pride when we say, I know what the Bible says, but I feel like it'll work better my way. And what's going on there? Well, I mean, that's maybe the most blatant form of pride that I can think of, where I'm elevating my feelings over God's revelation. I mean, God who put us together, God who knit us in our mother's womb, the God who put together our hearts, our minds, our physical beings, he's saying, this is how it works best. And we're going, well, I don't feel that way, God. I don't feel that way, God. No, Paul's saying, that's pride. Humble yourself. Bend your knee. Do what, do what God is saying to do, and it will work out better for the good of the person. So he's saying, real love is going to be when we take the steps that we need to take that God has said should be taken with people to see the changes happen that, that only God can help bring, bring, bring about. Again, when we're looking at this, the question continues to come in, this doesn't feel like love. Well, I think part of what we have to remember here is the guy who's writing this, again, inspired by the Holy Spirit, Paul is also the guy who wrote Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 where he said brethren if anyone is caught in any trespass you who are spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted so he's saying this this goes together loving gently with an eye for restoration and taking some hard steps sometimes in order to see that restoration occur. I mean, going even further than that, going even further than that, all of you have been to weddings before, and if you have, you've probably heard the 1 Corinthians 13 passage on love being defined, on love being read out. And it's a love that does what? A love that believes the best, a love that is patient and long-suffering, a love that has the interests of others ahead of our own interests. Again, the Apostle Paul, the guy who wrote 1 Corinthians 13, wrote 1 Corinthians 5, and get this, it's in the same letter. It's in the same letter to the church in Corinth. He writes a few pages before, kick them out, a few pages later, and this is love. Do what's best for them. 
do what's best for them. So it, it is a matter of love being the overriding principle in judging. It's understanding that the motivation has gotta be right for us to be able to step in and, and do that, to look at the idea that it's all about restoration and, and not punishment. I mean, again, the point is, when you do love somebody, when you really love somebody, you, you never want to overlook self-destructive behavior. I mean, do you, with somebody you love? Are you just gonna let them continue on in self-destructive behavior? And, and the answer should be no. Real love steps in to help. Again, a lot of qualifications, we'll look at that in just a moment. Not just for anybody, not just for everybody, not really for strangers. It comes out of relationship. It comes when you've got, it comes when you've, you've built up some, some equity, some love equity with the person before you can step in with this kind of, of situation. And I'm assuming that the church in Corinth already had that, that in place. Let's move on though and see what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 to 8. He's saying, kick the guy out, and we're doing that because we love him and we want to see him restored. But then he goes on and he gives another reason. He says, it's not only because we love him, he says, I'm telling you to kick him out because I love y'all. I love y'all, the whole church. And this affects everybody, whether you think so or not. He says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast not with old leaven nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and, and truth. He's saying, look, we need to love the guy, but we also need to understand that love for the church needs to come into play and that sin is like yeast and it will work its way through until it affects the entire lump of dough. The idea is it's contagious. Again, again, we're talking about something that we receive as the revelation of God by faith and we don't put ourselves in the position of saying, I know what, that's what the Bible says, but not me. Not me, I can stand against that. I'm not gonna fall to that. Our church is different. We know the word. We're people of the Bible. We're not gonna let ourselves be led into nonsense like this. And again, the revelation from God says, yeah, you can. Yeah, you will. Don't, don't let your feelings trump the revelation that I've come, that I've given to you. It affects things in ways we don't understand. Um, kind of the, the story for this that brings it home to me is the story of a guy named Achan in the Old Testament. Achan in the Old Testament, you might be familiar with the story. It's in Joshua chapter 7, first 12 verses. What happens in that story that historical account, is that Israel has finally made it to the promised land. They come in, they're going in to take Canaan, the promised land, and God has given them instructions on taking the walled city of Jericho, powerful city. And he said, look, march around the city, walls are gonna come down, you're gonna get all the loot in the city, you're gonna defeat the city. He says, but here's the deal. When you go into Jericho, take all the loot, take all the valuable stuff they have, but every single bit of it comes to me, to God, and goes into the temple. Now, now, after this, you're gonna take a lot of other cities and all of the loot from all of the other cities, you get to keep for yourself. You get to keep for yourself. But this first city, kind of the principle of the first fruits, this first loot of the city comes to me. So they go in, walls fall down, they take Jericho, and they go in and take all the loot. The whole army of Israel goes in, takes all the loot, and the whole army of Israel does just like God said and brings the loot back to the temple, except for one guy who took one shiny little object and hid it in his tent. Guy named, his name was Achan. One guy out of all of the armies of Israel takes this one thing, hides it in his tent, okay? Nobody knows about it, and then Israel goes out for their next battle against this tiny podunk town with no walls around it, and they end up getting defeated. I think 36 or so of them get killed. 36 Israelite soldiers get killed in this battle. And they come back and go, God, what's going on? What's the matter? Why did you give us one and not the other? And God says, because there's sin in the camp. And what happens is, it's identified then that Achan took one little thing and that one man hid that one little thing and it affected the entire nation the entire nation, the entire camp. And God said, you gotta take care of that first. Take care of Achan first, 
and then things are going to go like they're supposed to go. And they did. And then things went well for them from then on in the, the battles that they had in, in Canaan. I mean, again, I look at that and I go, that's not fair, God. I mean, what in the world is going on with this? One guy takes one thing and everybody suffers. 36 guys, in fact, die because of this who had nothing to do with this guy Achan taking it in the first place. Well, again, there's a principle that's at play here that goes beyond my ability to understand in terms of fairness, but it's a revelation that God's provided in terms of the importance that he places on on how his body, how his people work. Old Testament with Israel, New Testament with his church. And he's saying this is what it's supposed to look like. This is what it's supposed to look like with the church. It's not about, it's not about being perfect. It's, thank God it's not that we have to be perfect to all be together. But it is about knowing where the lines are drawn. It is about understanding that, that love is not affirming of all actions and all choices that people make that there are areas and times when God says, no, if it's somebody who's claiming to be a follower of Jesus, then you address it. If it's somebody who's claiming to be a born again son or daughter of the living God, then you judge. Now again, like I said, we get it so backwards. I mean, what, what do we do? What do we do typically? I mean, typically we're all about judging those folks out there. We're typically all about judging those folks in the world. I mean, that's why we got signs waving on the side of the highway. I mean, signs waving on the high, side of the highway. I mean, when I was in college, I, I can remember this guy um, on campus at FSU who always had the signs waving, fornicators are all going to hell. On the side of the highway later, you see homosexuals are all going to hell. Well, you know what? People who run stoplights are all going to hell too. It's the idea that everybody's going to hell but for, but for the grace of God and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and Christ on the cross and, and grabbing hold of what Jesus did on the cross for us. And the, the, the silly idea that we ought to be out in the world telling people who are sinners to change means that we don't understand what salvation is even about. People who are not in don't have the capacity to change. People who are not in are functioning according to their identity. We're supposed to be addressing people who have a different identity and a different capacity that comes by way of regeneration, that comes by way of being born again. The the idea is we we have this, this idea that the only thing that's involved in Christianity is raise your hand, walk aisle, and I made a decision to follow Jesus. There needs to be a decision to follow Jesus, but that's tied in with a supernatural metamorphosis that happens by way of the Holy Spirit where we are actually regenerated, where we are actually changed with new capacities and we actually have the ability to do things that we couldn't do before. This is what Paul's talking about. You judge people who have the ability to do something about what you're judging. You don't go around judging people who don't have any ability to do what you're judging them about. And in the process, you also do what? You play into the stereotypes they have of who we are. The stereotype of being a narrow-minded, judgmental bigot who, who tries to impose what we think is right on people who don't even have the same frame of reference. I mean, really, how silly is it? We're trying to get people to agree with us on things that they haven't agreed is true in the first place. And so he's saying, no, there's there's got to first be that that evangelism that goes out. There's first got to be that proclamation of the word. There's first got to be a revival that happens where, where people are changed, where people are saved, where people are regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit and and then clean it up. Again, we've talked about this before. You don't clean a fish before you catch it. You catch the fish and then you clean it. We're out there on the street so often thinking we can clean all these fish up before we've ever got them in the net in the first place. A crass example, but but it's it's the the reality of of what we're what we're what we're dealing with. First Corinthians fifteen thirty three, Paul is is talking there again to the church of Corinth saying, look, bad company corrupts good morals. He is not talking about the bad company of the world. He's talking about the bad company within the church. He's saying, don't eat 
don't eat, don't even eat here, he says, with believers who are off in the yayas on the deep end. So let's say you meet somebody at work this week. You say, you know, are, um, are you an adulterer? Are you a homosexual? Are you a liar, a cheat? Are you, I mean, whatever the list. And they say, yeah, I am. And you go, are you a Christian? No, I'm not. Let's have dinner together. Let's have dinner together. That's exactly what you ought to be doing. But if you meet somebody who's claiming to be a follower of Jesus and they say yes to any of those things, again, if it's something they've embraced as lifestyle, then no. At that point, that's where it says we need to, to be putting them out is the way that, that it's, it's described here. I mean, uh, uh, again, it's about identity and, and capacity. It's about two categories of people in the world, saints and, and sinners. That's basically the division that we see in Scripture. The Bible talks about anybody who has, by grace through faith, received what Jesus did, been regenerated, born again, a saint by definition. Does that mean you're perfect? No. People who have them, they're described as sinners. Does that mean saints never sin? Absolutely not. Saints still sin. But it's a question of identity. The identity of a sinner is a sinner. The identity of a saint is being a saint. Sinners can still do some good stuff. Saints can still do some bad stuff. But the source of identity has, has been shifted. There's been a shift from, with a saint, a shift from team Adam to team Jesus. And the whole idea is that salvation moves us from team Adam to team Jesus. It's understanding that, that sin, not a popular word I know, but sin is, is first a noun, not a verb. Sin is a thing that entered the world. Sin is a thing that entered the world through one man like a disease, like COVID-19 is a noun. COVID-19 came in as a thing, right? The idea is that it's a noun, sin is a noun, a thing that results in verbs. It's a thing that results in, in, in actions. You've got to deal, we've got to deal with, with the noun before we can deal with the verbs, with the actions that come from it. This is the Bible's explanation of how death entered the world. No death was planned before sin came in. The cure for death has come through Jesus who deals with the noun. Everybody was born in Adam, in sin, with the noun in place, and then continues to act out the verbs, the actions of sin until the identity has been changed. And so we're talking about the idea, again, in 1 Corinthians 5, of identity having come into play with the change happen. Let's, let's read on through the, the rest of this section of 1 Corinthians 5, 9 to 13. We've talked about it, but let's see exactly how he said it. Paul said, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of the world or with the covetous and swindlers or with idlers, for then you would have to go out of the world. He's saying, you misunderstood my other letters because Paul actually wrote several letters to the church in Corinth. He's saying, you misunderstood things. I wasn't saying don't go out and, you know, don't associate with all of those people in the world. Don't associate with all those people in Corinth who are still, you know, going to the church temples and worshiping idols. I'm not saying don't associate with them. If you did, you wouldn't have anywhere to go. He said, actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person. Or, get this, he wasn't just talking about sex here. He says, or if he's covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Again, not talking about one-off instances, not talking about even a pattern if somebody's wanting to change. He's talking about a lifestyle. He's talking about embracing this particular area where you don't wanna change, where you wanna stay just as you are. He says, what do I have to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? Other translations say, <laughs> you do not judge outsiders, you only judge those who are in the church. But those who are outside, God judges. Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. So, again, this is where we get to the idea of this being perhaps the most disobeyed passage of Scripture in the Bible. Because do we do that? And the answer is no. Most of the time we don't. Because we're all about judging outsiders. We're all about, you know, condemning those people who have some lifestyle that's different than, than we know God says he wants. But he's saying, 
you know, don't go, don't go after the lifestyle. Don't go after the sin, but address, at least don't go after the action to the sin, but address the noun, address the heart, address the identity, and point the way to the new identity through Jesus. Point the way to the forgiveness that comes from Jesus. And then, take all of that, that, that passionate desire for purity, take it off the streets and take it into the church. Take that passionate desire for purity and, and have it applied among ourselves. Again, exactly the opposite of how we do. Because what are we ready to do? What am I ready to do? I'm ready to cut slack with people on the inside. I'm ready to overlook. I'm ready to say grace covers it all. And it does. But God says love people more than that. Love people more than that. Love people in a way where they're going to look at you and say, that's not very loving. But you know you're doing it from a motivation of, of wanting to see the best. Of wanting to see the best for that person. Now, Let's bring it home as we close up here in the next six or seven minutes. I want to bring it home because truly what we've talked about so far is a little abstract. Um, and let's talk about how we can take this whole matter of, of um, judging and how it's actually going to be playing out for us this week maybe. Right now there are three different audiences of people that are watching online, that are sitting outside, or that are right in here. Three different audiences of people. First audience. First audience, and I'm talking just with Christians right now, just with believers. First audience is, you're somebody who sizes people up and then writes them off. Sizes people up and writes them off. Sizes people up and then you write them off and it's rooted in a kind of self-righteousness. If their sin, though, doesn't break your heart, it's probably because your heart has never been broken over your own sin. And you need to repent. And you need to repent. If you are able to size people up and just write them off, something's wrong. Something's wrong with our love capacity. Second audience out there. You size people up and you walk away. You size people up and you walk away. You, 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 you size people up and you, you can say, yeah, there, but for the grace of God, go I. And, you know, looking at you, it reminds me how much better off I am now because of Jesus. But your issues are your own business. I'm not my brother's keeper. And the truth is, we are our brother's keeper. The truth is, we are supposed to get in our sisters and our brothers' business sometimes. If they're not taking care of their business, there are times at which selected ones of us are to take care of, get into helping them take care of, of their, their own business. It, it's, it's the idea that it is our job to confront sometimes. It's our job to confront sometimes. Now, yeah, going back to Jesus' teaching in Matthew 7, where he says, judge not, and like I said, there's a comma there, not a period. What does he say to do before you judge? He says, get the log out of your own eye and then get the speck out of your brother's eye. It's the idea that, yeah, we've got to have some self-awareness going on, but, but the idea is to have that self-awareness self -awareness lead us to the place where we can speak into our, our brother's or our sister's lives and, and confront Again, need to learn how to do it properly, need to learn how to do it with gentleness, need to do it with love, need to bring the truth home. We need to do it, again, in a way or at a time when there's a relationship in place. I, I've talked to you guys before, but the whole checkbook theory with, with confronting. The idea is before you can con confront somebody, it's kind of like a checkbook. You can't make withdrawals from a checking account until you've put a deposit in first. There have got to be some deposits of relational love, of relational connection, of relational care, some deposits before you can make the withdrawal that happens as you confront somebody with something. So again, it's not just randomly going out and picking out some people that you've had your eye on for a while but don't have any relationship with. It needs to be some, there needs to be some connection in place with that. So anyway, first category again, first audience, you size people up and write them off. Second category, you size people up and walk away because you don't want to get involved in their mess. You don't want to get involved in a situation where they're going to get mad at you perhaps. And then number three, number three, big category, big category, you have been sized up, but you've refused to listen. You've written off the people who sized you up as judgmental. 
<laughs> they said, you know, I'm trying to help you, but you refused to budge. And, and, and here's the, the thing. Defensiveness will guarantee that your past is going to show up in, in your future. <laughs> the idea here is you don't like being confronted. I don't like being confronted because I'm prideful. But the excuses that come in are that, well, well, they did it in a harsh way. They didn't do it with love. They didn't do it with sufficient kindness. Nobody confronts perfectly. Nobody confronts perfectly. And we can't hide behind the imperfections in the way that we've been confronted to avoid listening to the confrontation in the first place. I mean, the idea is most people, not all people, but most people are taking a huge risk when they reach out to confront you. They do it out of love, knowing the sacrifice that they may be making in the process. And, and get this, Jesus never said, do not let yourself be judged. So you don't have any scriptural basis to stand on with that. So you need to let, let that part of it go. Now, now, if you were listening to that, and I hope you were, we're gonna take it one more step into um, the, the very awkward, okay? So that we can remember this Valentine's Day. And let's, right now, go through these, these three audiences and practice what we, we just talked about. What I, go th- what I wanna do is I wanna go through the three audiences that I know we have out there, and I wanna ask you whether you fall into that audience, whether you fall into the audience of writing somebody off, whether you fall into the audience of walking away, not wanting to ever confront, whether you fall into the audience of failing to listen. And here's the idea, this isn't just an exercise so that we can get some statistics. Nobody's counting. This isn't an exercise in order to to play some game, but it's for us to make a statement before God in humility that says, I have some self-awareness. It's starting to break through here. I get it in terms of what I'm doing, and I do want to address this and change because I want to love more effectively. I want to exercise humility. And, and with humility, God operates with this carrot on a stick approach. He says, go on and try it, and the promise that's connected with humility, I'll give you grace. God gives grace to the humble. What's that mean? He gives more power. He gives more access. He gives more of everything as we exercise a humility that, that refuses to let pride have its way. So let's, let's just go through the list real quickly here and, and take a step towards seeing a little more clearly with ourselves. So uncross your arms if they're crossed right now and let's make a statement before, before God. How many, or is there anybody here with category number one in place for you? That is, have you, do you size people up and write them off? And I know I do it. Anybody? Size people up and write them off. Okay. How many size people up and walk away because you don't want to get involved in confronting? And how many, how many have been sized up and you refuse to listen because you didn't like the one who was providing the sizing up? You know, when we're looking at these categories, it's a situation where in the first, sizing up and writing people off, there needs to be repentance. There needs to be repentance. If it's the category of sizing people up and walking away, it's a particular kind of repentance. It's got to be a willingness to take the difficult step of, of confronting, again, in love, with kindness, carefully, prayerfully, and where there's relationship in place. And then... With the last category, if you've been sized up and refused to listen, there needs to be a commitment before God that you're going to swallow the pride, that you're going to swallow the the fear that's involved in that, and and start listening. It doesn't mean you have to do what anybody says. It it doesn't mean that, that everybody is going to give you the right information as they speak to you. But we need to be willing to hear it. We need to be willing to listen to it and then bring it before the Lord and determine whether 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 that's something that that needs to be addressed in us. I mean, each of us needs to be ready to take the next step, whatever the next step is. 
to move along in this process of sanctification, of discipleship, because we've got a mission that, that is not a small deal. Our mission is to see the will of God done on earth as it is in heaven. Our mission is to see disciples made. Our mission is to see the kingdom extended in Kona and throughout the islands of Hawaii. And, and it needs to be done in the way that God says it's supposed to be done. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your patience with us, your love for us. We thank you, Father, for the revelation of your word, even the difficult passages like 1 Corinthians 5. And I, I just ask you, Holy Spirit, now to move and break down barriers, intellectual, emotional, to break down barriers that come from experiences, bad experiences we've had in the past, to put us in a place where we're ready to humbly step into everything that you've got for us and to do it in the way that you've laid out for us to do it. Father, we want to be people who love more effectively, who love in reality, who love the people that you put in our, in our lives in a way that seeks their best over ours. All of this, Father, we ask in the power of Jesus Christ's name and for your glory. Amen.